Welcome back to the Data Stack Show. Today we're talking with Kevin Hu from Metaplane. Costas, there are a lot of tools in the data observability space, um, and that's what Metaplane does. And I'm interested to know, uh, of course, I do a lot of stocking on our guests before the shows. I'm interested to know he came out of uh, MIT, and so this won't surprise you, but I want to know how he went from MIT to uh, starting Metaplane. Um, you know, because that's an interesting dynamic sort of coming out of academia and then going through Y Combinator uh, and starting a company. So I just want to hear that backstory. How about you? Yeah, I want to learn more about the product, to be honest. I mean, uh, it's data observability and data quality and like, I don't know what other name uh, we're going to have tomorrow for the category. It's like a very hot product category right now in terms of like developments and like innovation. And I think he's the right person like to chat about that. So let's uh, see how Metaplane uh, understands and implements data observability and also what's next after that. Like what are the plans there and where the industry is going? Let's do it. Let's do it. Kevin, welcome to the Data Sec Show. Uh, we're so excited to chat with you. So excited to be here. Um, I'm a longtime listener of the show. I recognize both of your voices and to be <laughs> here with you on the Zoom, uh, it's really a privilege. So thank you. Cool. Uh, well, we are. Uh, we always love uh, hearing from our listeners and especially when they are guests on the show. Um, so I want to, uh, of course I do LinkedIn stalking. Our listeners know this. You probably know this from listening to the show. Uh, so you started at MIT uh, studying physics and then you made the switch over to focusing on more computer science subjects. And so I have two questions for you. One, why did you make the switch? And then two, did that influence you starting Metaplane, uh, actually sort of studying you know, those topics from, a, from an academic standpoint? Yeah, I think, well, one great research, it's true, Kostas <laughs> and I both found ourselves in the either fortunate and privileged or unfortunate place of CSU yeah. <laughs> uh, at some point. And I, I did start studying physics and I remember the, the gauntlet course at the time, which was the experimental lab course everyone took as a junior, uh, was notorious for burning people out. And Every week you replicate a Nobel Prize winning experiment and the second week you analyze it. Something that really stood out to me was the people who had the hardest time in the course weren't necessarily the people who weren't the best physics students, but it was the people who didn't know MATLAB and didn't know Python. So they could collect the data, but weren't able to analyze it. Mm. They were the ones who are pulling all nighters. And at the same time, my sister, who is a biologist, she, had about five years of data on fish behavior. So tilapia are very interesting fish where <laughs> you have a tank of them, you drop in another tilapia and all the other tilapia change. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, they're very uh, yeah, tribal, uh, very easy to observe. And at the end of five years, she messages me saying, hey, Kevin, can you help me analyze this data because I don't know R. And to me, this is just absurd because why are some of the brightest people in the world bottlenecked because they don't know how to write code? And mm. obviously that doesn't apply only to scientists, but really to anyone who works in an organization who either produces data or consumes data. If they don't know how to program, you're not necessarily uh, working with data in the most low friction way. So that's how I got into CS research, trying to build tools and develop methods for automated data analysis. This is back in 2013. Okay, wow, super interesting. Tilapia are also tasty, by the way. Um, you know, if you're a good cook. That's a good data point. <laughs> that is a data point. That's a qualitative data point. Um, happy to share that with your sister. <laughs> um, yeah, I have plenty of tilapia data points too. Hopefully your <laughs> listeners are not fish or you know, more people. Uh, That's right. <laughs> okay, so um, tell us, so you studied, um, you studied uh, computer science tooling, how to sort of su uh, support people, help people um, based on your experience of really bright people not being able to analyze data. 
take us from there to starting Metaplane and then tell us what Metaplane is and does. So for six years, we built tools that given a CSV, try and predict the most interesting by some measure, like visualizations or analyses that could come from that CSV. So hmm. at first it was really rule based, but then it was more machine learning based where we had a lot of data sets and visualizations and analyses scraped from the web. Uh, and the, the papers were very, really interesting. And it turned out you could predict how analysts worked on a data set with relatively high accuracy. The problem hmm. was when we tried to deploy it at large companies, uh, including Colgate Palmolive, Estee Lauder, uh, they funded a large part of my PhD and I still have many goodie bags. Uh, some of my <laughs> colleagues have GPUs, I have uh, retinol. Lots of toothpaste. <laughs> yeah, tons of, to oh, I'm not complaining. <laughs> but the, the problem was when we wanted to deploy these tools, it became very clear, like, okay, connect us to your database. And they'll ask like, okay, what database? We have like 23 instances of SAP. <laughs> and this was back in you know, 2015 and 2016. So it was a bit worse back then than it is today, but it became clear that like data quality is one of the biggest impediments to working with data, not necessarily when you have a final clean data set in the last mile generating the analyses of that. So that's the motivation to build Metaplane where you know we couldn't necessarily make that flower grow uh, now we have the augmented analytics and different categories arising trying to do that analysis. But we figure you know, if we can plant the garden, maybe someone else can take it for, from there. Mm, very cool. And so tell us tell us about Metaplane. Like what's, what's the problem that it solves? It's Metaplane, we like to think of it as the data dog for data. It's a data observability tool that connects across your data stack to your warehouse like Snowflake, to your transformation tool like DBT, a BI tool like Looker. And very simply, we tell you when something might be going wrong. Specifically, there's a big asymmetry that we observe today where data teams are responsible for hundreds or thousands of tables and dashboards. And this is great uh, in part because you know data is becoming a product, right? It's no longer used just within the main vein of BI and decision support, even though that will always be important, but getting reverse ETL, okay, maybe that term is not cool anymore, but being sent to activated into <laughs> go-to-market tools, uh, being used to train machine learning models. Uh, and that is all good. Uh, the promise of data is you know, starting to be more and more true. However, while your data team is responsible for hundreds of tables, your VP of sales only cares about one report, which is the liquor dashboard that they're currently looking at. So there's this asymmetry where frequently teams find out about data issues or silent data bugs, as we call them, when the users of data notice it and then messes the data team. Uh, that matters for two reasons. One is that if you've received those Slack alerts, and if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have. <laughs> uh, you know that, you know, there goes your afternoon and you did not have much time to spare to begin with. Yeah. But to like data, trust is very easy to lose and hard to regain, especially when it comes to data. Because once that VP of sales decides to, okay, screw this, I'm going to have my RevOps team build up reporting, you know, in a shadow data stack, then what was the point of getting, you know, a snowflake and getting all this data together to begin with? Right? If you don't have a culture around trusting data, it doesn't really matter how much of it you collect or use. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to dig in on one thing and then and then I'll hand the mic over to Costas. Um, but could you describe, so you you mentioned um, you know, silent uh, the silence of sort of errors, you know, or bugs or problems that happen um, with data which is a really interesting way to think about the problems that we face in data. So two questions for you. One, how do you think sort of the, the audible nature of those things differs in data, say, as compared with like software engineering? Because, you know, software engineering, like if we think about Datadog, 
um, you know, there's a lot of defined process and tooling or whatever, a lot of that's being adopted into the data world. So one would love a comparison there. And then two, could you just describe in a, you know, on a deeper level and maybe do this first, like what, describe a silent problem and like, why are the problems with data silent or why do you even use that term? Yeah, let's start from that silent data bug. Great questions where frequently you know, all of your jobs are running fine, right? Airflow is all green, Snowflake is up, and yet your table might have 10% of the rows that you expected. Or that some distribution, like the mean you know, revenue metric has shifted uh, a little bit over uh, to an incorrect value. So these sorts of issues in the data itself, unless you have something that is continuously monitoring the values of the data, aren't necessarily flagged by infrastructural issues, mm. like your systems being up or your jobs running. And that's why we, we do want to like make the silent data bugs more audible, increase the volume a little bit. Because if you don't know about these issues occurring along the way, then inevitably the only place that you will notice it is at the very end, right? When the data is being consumed. Uh, one, because that person has the most incentives to make sure that the data is correct. But frequently the person who's using the data also has the most domain expertise. Mm. If they're on the sales team, they might know what exactly should go into this revenue number. They might not have know how, how it was calculated along the way, but they know when it's wrong. Yeah. And that is one departure from software observability, which really is the inspiration for data observability, right? The, the term was completely co-opted from like the data dogs sure. and Splunks of the world. But to be fair, they co-opted the term from control theory where observability <laughs> has a very strict definition Right, as like the mathematical duel for the controllability of a system, a dynamical system where you want to understand how like the state changes from the inputs. So I don't feel too bad about yeah. this stealing the term. All, all so. art is theft, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> now, if we keep tracing it all the way down, like back hundreds of years, we'll find you know a Dutch physicist trying to figure <laughs> out how to make windmills turn at the same rate as grain should be ground, which is true. <laughs> I love it. I love right, it. Right. So, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just to finish that one thought yeah. that, um, yeah, in, in the software world, before the data dogs, right, you would frequently find out about data issues, I mean, software and infrastructure issues when the API went down or when your heartbeat check failed. Uh, but as the number of assets that you're deploying, increases and increases, that level of visibility is just not sufficient, right? Now, if you're on a software team, uh, it's almost mind blowing to think that you want your customers to find out when your API is failing or when a, a query is slow. Like you want to find out about that regression internally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, before we resume the conversation about observability, uh, I want you to go back to physics and your undergraduate studies. And I want to ask you, and that's like a very personal like curiosity that I have, like from all the stuff that you have done in physics, what was, let's say, the one that required the most uh, in terms of like working with data and uh, using R or Python? Like what you, what you talk, like what do you think that like, couldn't exist in a way almost, let's say, if we can exaggerate as a domain of physics, if we couldn't have, if we didn't have like today, like computers and all these languages and all these systems like to go and like crunch the data. Oh, I have two answers to that question. Uh, one is when I was doing more pure physics research, like uh, AMO, atomic, molecular and optical physics research. So you can think about, you know, uh, ultra cool atoms uh, using laser cooling and trapping, where the fine level of control that you need to calibrate these systems, and then the amount of data that you're retrieving from the systems that you're observing is immense, right? Yeah. There's, there's a reason why, you know, high performance computing was really uh, 
like invented at, at CERN and why the internet was kind of invented uh, at these scientific research facilities is they have, they had the need for data first. And then even today, the scientific computing ecosystem almost exists separate from our data stack. Yep. The, the qualities of the data are completely different. Yep. Um, the other strain was at some point, I got more interested in like quantitative social science research. So we published this paper on the network of languages oh. so trying to understand how information flows from person to person uh, via the languages that they know. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, there's nothing stopping us from going to uh, any news site in another language besides the fact that we might not know that language. Mm -hmm. so we had uh, tons of data at the time uh, about bilingual Twitter users, about Wikipedia editors who edited Wikipedia in more than one language, mm -hmm. uh, translations from one language to another to try and figure out the, the connectedness and the clusters of different languages. So that wasn't necessarily a problem of big data necessarily. Yeah. It all fit on one person's laptop, but we wouldn't have collected that data if yeah. it wasn't today. Yeah, yeah, 100%. No, 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 that's, that's super interesting. And yeah, I remember like at some point, one of the first episodes that we had, we had like a guest who worked at CERN. Like he was yeah. taking care of like the infrastructure there and writing like code in C++ like to run the data there. And uh, it, it, it was funny to hear him saying like what's he, what was his first impression when after his PhD, he went into the industry and hearing about big data and like people saying like okay we need like a whole cluster like to crunch this data and he was like okay like are you serious like do you consider this like <laughs> <laughs> big yeah he was like oh like i mean he was dealing with petabytes and petabytes of data i mean just an unbelievable amount so he goes to work in insurance and he's like i mean this is the kiddie pool <laughs> <laughs> Totally. There's levels to the game, right? And I'm sure that when he talk, like goes down the hall to another person that's starting that like petabytes, like we have even more data than that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 super interesting like to see the different perspectives when someone is coming like from uh, scientific computing and uh, the point of view that they have and like how you solve the problems like with working a lot of day with a lot of data. Although okay, we, we also have to say that like the needs are completely different, like the environment, the context that they do the processing is also very different. So it's not like exactly comparable, right? Like you cannot say that the work that Facebook is trying to do with the data that they have is like the same type of problems that are solved by highly parallelized algorithms like trying to solve partial uh, differential equations, for example, right? Like this is like very, very different like problems and they have um, different needs, both in terms of infrastructure and the software and the algorithms that we are using. Um, totally. But yeah, like 100%, I mean, um, there is a reason, as you said, that like the internet, uh, the web came out of, uh, uh, of CERN and like all these technologies, like they're like uh, highly associated like with physics. Okay, enough with physics. Sure. Uh, let's go back to data observability. Uh, so, my I have like a question about we, to, yeah, we use a lot, and it's very interesting because you talked about uh, like um, this experiment with languages and uh, when you're like bilingual and like all that stuff. But something similar, I think, is also like happening when we introduce like new product categories, right? Like, as you said, like we we uh, stole like the term observability from Datadog that took the term observability from like control theory and who knows about the Dutch guy who was what was doing. Um, but when we are talking about we are using like and you used with uh, Eric like the term bug right and silent bug. Uh, but like okay like in software when we are talking about like bugs there's like a very, let's say, clear uh, relationship between, uh, how to say that, like it's a very deterministic thing, right? Like, okay, there are like a few bugs that it's hard like to find them, especially like in distributed systems and stuff like that, where the behavior is not that deterministic necessarily. 
But like broadly, when we are talking about bugs, we are talking about like something very deterministic as a system, right? But with data, my feeling is that when we're talking about bugs on data, it's not exactly that. Like there's much more vagueness there and it's not that like clear to define what the bug is. Uh, and that's why many times I, I, I say that like maybe it's better to use the term trust, like how much we can trust the data, right? So from a binary relationship, bug or not bug, we go into like how much we can trust something. So what's your uh, experience with that? And like what's common and what's not common between patterns from software engineering and data uh, and working with data? You're so right that the way that we refer to data as having bugs is not is not one to one with software, right? Like a, yeah. a software bug, it's a logical issue that somehow your logic did not produce the outcomes that you expected when it encountered the real world, right? Either the real world was more complicated than you thought, which is mm -hmm. seemingly the case, or your logic was not uh, was not sound. Yep. Uh, in which case, you get someone to review your PRs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, you know, the engineers on my team will be like, well, Kevin, you, yeah, the uh, data bugs are interesting because I think the root cause can be equally similar in some cases where, yes, there are logical issues within your DAG, um, your DAG extending beyond the warehouse, but from very beginning to very end, right, it, it is conceptually a chain of logical operations, but the the data could be input wrong, right? It either came from a machine that did not do what you expected or mm -hmm. a person entered in the wrong number. So you're right that the, the scope of a data bug is a little bit larger uh, in that sense. And as a result, the what goes into data observability is slightly different than what goes into software observability. Because mm -hmm. in software, you have the notion of traces, right? Mm -hmm. like in data, you have an incident that occurs, but also the traces, right? The time or the time correlated or the request scoped logs that help you. Like, okay, where did this begin and where did this end? Uh, and in data, right, that's kind of replaced by the concept of lineage, mm -hmm. right? But the, the the tricky thing is that lineage is never perfect. Yeah, that that's until snowflake starts surfacing it to everyone right and snowflake will not cover it end to end right you also need an yeah. api tool and upstream as well maybe they'll work with rudder stack to figure it out but there's always some loss of of resolution along the way mm -hmm. so uh, as a result right even if you build all those integrations and build an amazing parser like you're still working with incomplete information mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, traces in the devops world can be extremely exact yeah, you might not be inferring inferring causality, but at least you have all the metadata that is relevant. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, like with observability uh, in DevOps, uh, like from a product perspective, the problem that you have there is that like you need to build an experience uh, that's probably like going like there's too much resolution in a way, right? Like there's like just like too much data, and you need like to help the user navigate all this data uh, to find the root cause, right? Uh, so that's the the product like the uh, the problem the problem that you have trying to design a product experience with that. But when we are talking about data observability, we have vagueness together with probably way too much data at the same time. Because if you start like collecting all the, the lineage the metadata, like yeah, like you can also have like an explosion there. So uh, how do you? do that how do you like how do you build like an experience that can help people like navigate this vagueness and complexity at the same time to figure out like the root cause of the problem right at the end or uh figure out if they can trust the data or not part of this is a a very challenging like computational problem mm -hmm. on the back end like let's and then another part of it is a ui ux problem which mm -hmm. is no less difficult. It may even be more important. So like, let's take, for example, uh, a table is delayed, right? That it's usually refreshed every 10 minutes and it's been, you know, let's say it's been two hours and that is unusual even after taking seasonality into account. 
mm -hmm. where if we surface this issue to our customer, then we'd be like, okay, that's useful. Uh, but almost always the first question is, does this matter? Mm -hmm. That the table is not being used by anyone. Maybe we don't need to fix it right now. And then the second question is, what is the root cause? So can I do something about it? And only mm -hmm. when all those three pieces fall into place, like in, a real issue has occurred, it has an impact, and I can do something about it, uh, is this necessarily going to bubble to the top of your triage list? Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, what that means is being very, I mean, it means a few things on the meta plane side or any tool that's trying to do this for you. One is building really robust integrations across your data stack. So it needs to be in your BI tool, ingesting all of your dashboards and the components of those dashboards and getting the lineage to a table in as fine resolution as possible and making sure that that's up to date and reflecting the latest state of your warehouse and latest state of your BI tool. Mm -hmm. It means disambiguating entities correctly. So if you have a transactional database that's being replicated into your uh, analytical database, right? How do you know that one table refers to the other? If you mm -hmm. have a Fivetran sync, how do you know that this Fivetran sync is syncing those two, uh, like entity A to entity B? Mm -hmm. That's a tough problem. And then the third piece is, uh, I'll call it prioritization, right? Is one table might have a hundred downstream dashboards. Right. Mm -hmm. And how exactly do you want to surface this to your user, right? Do you just say the number 100 or do you list all 100? And yeah. there's a, a principle, at least in um, information visualization, uh, Schneider's, Schneiderman's mantra of the inventor of the tree map. He's the professor at University of Maryland, I believe. He always says like overview first and then uh, filter and finally details on demand. So the way that we try and do that matter plane is like giving you as useful of an overview of what happened in an incident mm -hmm. and then letting you filter down what you think is relevant and then finally zooming in on the details when you want it. Mm -hmm. For example, the number of times that one dashboard that depends on this table has been used. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's super interesting. And you mentioned, okay, you said like it's both like a UI, UX and a computational problem. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about the computational problem. So what are the challenges there? Like what are the challenges um, that needs to happen on the back end and like the methodology and the algorithms that you have to use uh, to track these things and make sure that you surface the right thing to, uh, to the user at the end? One tough problem is anomaly detection mm -hmm. where the one reason why data observability exists as a category uh, is because it's tough to test your data manually, right? There are great tools to do that um, where you say, okay, I expect this value to be in above some threshold. And honestly, every tool, every company should probably have a tool like that uh, for the most critical tables. However, it, it becomes quite cumbersome to you uh, write code across your entire data warehouse and then merge a PR every time the data changes, mm -hmm. which is why data observability comes in where us and everyone in the category says, okay, you do that for the most important tables, but let our tool handle testing for everything else. Mm -hmm. And one necessary ingredient is some sort of anomaly detection. It could be machine learning based. It could be more traditional time series analysis where we track this number for you. And of course we had to take the traditional uh, components into your account. Like here's a trend component, here's a seasonal component, but there's a lot of bespoke aspects to both enterprise data. So for example, row counts tend to go up and they tend to go up at the same rate over time. And if you use an off the shelf tool, you're just gonna be sending false alerts every single time it goes up. Uh, but two, like your data is particular, right? Mm -hmm. Every company is a little bit different. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes into anomaly detection because mm -hmm. if you cry a wolf too many times, people are just going to turn you off. Yeah, of course. But the, the other component is log ingestion where uh, let's say you're using Snowflake, you have 365 days of query history, a tool like Metaplane 
will be ingesting all of that query history uh, and then parsing it for both usage, so understanding how tables and columns are being used, but also lineage. Mm -hmm. So like, what, what does this query depend on and what does it transform those dependencies into? And this is a notoriously difficult problem. Uh, I think no one has figured it out with 100% coverage and 100% accuracy across all data warehouses, except for the people who, the data warehouse vendors themselves. <laughs> Yeah, why why you say that 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 problem is like notoriously hard? Uh, what's the like what makes it so hard? Like you have all the queries that have been executed like the past three hundred and sixty five days. Uh, what's the difficult part that, like in using that to do like the lineage? It's a combination of differing SQL dialects from warehouse to warehouse. So mm -hmm. things are you know, starting to get standardized, right? Um, the, but what you, the parser that you write for Snowflake is different than the one that you might write for Redshift. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there's often a lot of ambiguity within the data warehouse, right? Like mm -hmm. which tables are being used within this query. And that's a relatively easy problem, but then what columns are being used mm -hmm. by those okay. tables. And you know, tables might have very overlapping or duplicate column names. Uh, and you might say, okay, well, the the you know the compiler is able to turn it is, you know, SQL is a well-defined language, right? Snowflake yeah. is able to turn this SQL into columns and tables that are being used, but they have access to the metadata and they have access to uh, you know their their runtime. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But absolutely, absolutely. Um, like, so you think that like this could be easier to handle if like more metadata were like exposed by the database system at the end, right? Like, if the, uh, yeah, if the information that was like exposed through Snowflake, for example, uh, was more like that would help like a lot to figure these um, things out. So it's more about exposing more of the internals of the database system at the end that is needed there. That's that's interesting. That's um, okay. It's very interesting. Uh, all right. Okay. I know about detection. So what are you doing on, uh, on your product like with anomaly detection right now? Like, do you have some kind of uh, functionality around that? And how does it work? Yeah, one quick note on the data warehouses releasing their internal lineage. I know that Snowflake is starting to do this. It may only be available to enterprise customers right now. Oh, okay. But uh, the moment they do that, one whole category of tools will have a much harder time, the data lineage tools, and everyone mm -hmm. else will be exponentially more powerful. Mm -hmm. like if we had access to that for all of our Snowflake customers, which is basically almost all of our customers, mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be insane. Uh, the amount of workflows that would unlock. Um, okay, that's interesting, actually. So it's going like to be a problem, like for the Linux companies and the products out there, obviously, because the the the, the product is going like the the functionality is going to be provided, let's say, by uh, um, by Snowflake. Uh, but at the same time, this is going like to make things much more um, interesting for you. But is there like a, is there a reason? I mean, why is this going to happen? Like outside of like having access to the metadata, to the additional metadata, is there something else that's like um, going to make it like more interesting because all your customers are on Snowflake, or like it doesn't matter? I think it's I think it's primarily being able to rely on their lineage over our lineage parts. Mm -hmm. Like just mm -hmm. assuming that they're much more correct and up to date and have higher coverage than we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's uh, on the other hand, that's like only the Linux that live like as part of Snowflake, right? Like that's what right. happens before and after that. Uh, so let's say you have, I don't know, let's say you have Spark doing some stuff on your S3 to prepare the data and then you load this data into Snowflake, which I think it's pretty common, like in many use cases. So even like if Snowflake does that, how do you can see outside of Snowflake, especially like before the data gets ingested in Snowflake? 
Totally. Yeah, they don't have the full picture, which is uh, why you know, data observability tools come in and kind of mm -hmm. augment, right? Say, okay, the lineage within the warehouse might be a very key part of the picture, mm -hmm. saying, but, but it's not all of it, right? It's not the downstream impact. It's not the upstream root cause. Yeah. Uh, which is how the two uh, play together a little bit. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, so back to anomaly detection. Uh, what do we get from you today in terms of anomaly detection? Like, what's what's happened? Like, what can I use out of the box? So out of the box right now, if you go to metaplane.dev, you can sign up uh, mm -hmm. and right, sign up through email or a G Suite and connect your warehouse, your transformation tool, your BI tool, uh, typically, people can do this within 15 minutes. We've had highly motivated users do it within five, which is insane because I can't even do it within five. Uh, but I guess when you want it, you really are motivated to, to do it. And off the bat, we cover your warehouse with tests based on information schema metadata. So for Snowflake, right, row counts and schema and freshness kind of come for free across your warehouse. You can go a little bit deeper with out of the box tests like testing uniqueness, nullness, uh, the distribution of numeric columns, or you can write custom SQL tests. And for all of these tests, uh, and our customers usually blanket their database and have hundreds of tests on top of those uh, within like 30 minutes, then you just let it sit because we have the anomaly detection kind of running for you in the background as we collect this historical training set and depending on how frequently your data changes it can be you know, either between one day or five days until you start getting alerts on mm -hmm. that data okay so oh all right so it's like between one and five days oh, that's that's neat and the deployments that you have so far right because we are talking about like data observability um the conversation that we have is like focusing a little bit more, that's how I feel at least, on the data warehouse. So would you say that what Metaplane is doing today is like more of observability of the data warehouse or you provide, let's say, observability across like the whole data stack that the company might have? Like, let's say I have streaming data and I have a Kafka somewhere and then I also have like a couple of other databases and then I might also have like a Teradata instance somewhere running like uh, how how uh, what kind of coverage you would say that like Metaplane today um, provides we are focused on the warehouse and it's next door neighbors right now mm -hmm. uh, part of that is uh, a strategic move as a, as a company, right? Like we want to start from the place of like highest concentration mm -hmm. and, you know, Snowflake is getting tons of market share as is Redshift, as is BigQuery, but we don't have to build a whole slew of integrations. Those three cover a lot of the market today. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of our customers use one of those three. We have the downstream BI integration, so Looker, Tableau, Mode, Sigma, kind of go down the list, Metabase we support, as well as the transactional databases like mm -hmm. MySQL and Postgres, and increasingly many OLAP databases like ClickHouse. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where we stop. And honestly, that's where everyone in our category stops today. Mm -hmm. I'm not very happy with that because this is just the level one of monitoring. Right? Yeah. When you check out an observability tool in two years or in five years, it's going to be completely different. It's going to be much like the picture that you mm -hmm. described, Costas, where it's like fully end to end. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I think that is not only important, but really critical because data is ultimately not produced from your data warehouse, right? Mm -hmm. Snowflake does not sell you data. It sells you a container into which you can put your data, yeah. but that, that data is being produced by product teams, engineering teams, go to market yeah. teams, and they're being consumed by those teams too. So when we talk about data trust, which you mentioned before, which I think is a much better category name than data observability because observability, mm -hmm. what, what, what is that? Uh, 
that trust is ultimately in the hands of the people who consume and produce the data. And mm -hmm. that's where we as a category have to go. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, hmm. Okay, so what's, uh, um, uh, what's your experience so far with uh, the other, let's say, big um, container of data, which is data lakes, right? So we have the data warehouses, a much more structured environment there, uh, but we also have like data lakes. Um, okay, Databricks is dominating there. Um, completely different environment when it comes like to interacting with data. Um, and okay, we get to the, I mean, there's also like this new thing now with the lake house where you also have like SQL interfaces there, but um, what have you seen so far like with data lakes um, and observability there? Because that's also like a big part, right? Uh, of like working with data, especially with big amounts of data. And in many cases, it's, let's say, um, this, this, like a lot of work that is happening before the load, the, the data is loaded into something like Snowflake, it has to go through like a data lake, right? So um, uh, is Metaplane doing something with them today? Plans to do something like in the future? And what do you think is the role that data lakes will have in the future? Honestly, we don't come across data lakes too often. Mm -hmm. Part of it is where we're focused in the market. Mm -hmm. where, like if you're, for example, at a company with less than 5,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, Metaplane is probably the right choice for you mm -hmm. uh, as the data observability tool, right? Fast time to value, time to implement, uh, the focus on the workflows. And if you're above 5,000, there are other options on the market and you might be in a position to build it in-house too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we found maybe this is incorrect that Databricks is much more highly concentrated at the enterprise. Yeah. And when, you know, when we come across a company that uses Databricks, frequently they're also using Snowflake mm -hmm. uh, for a data warehouse, and they're using Spark for pre, like pre Snowflake transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Oh, that's that's interesting. But you don't see like the need right now for Metaplane to work into like observability for these environments, right? Like, uh, because, and the reason I'm asking is because technically it's like something very different. And I'd love like to hear what are the challenges there? Like, what are the differences? And learn a little bit more about that. That's why I'm uh, insisting on these questions around like the data lakes and the Spark uh, ecosystem. There are some big challenges. I mean, there are some engineering challenges, like having to re rewrite all of our SQL queries into Spark queries, right? And mm -hmm. having it run not necessarily on a table, but on a data frame. And there are also differences in terms of the metadata that's available to you. Mm -hmm. uh, where a data warehouse metadata we found is quite rich in comparison with the metadata that you might have within a data lake. Mm -hmm. where you might have the number of rows, but to, or, or not, but right? you might have to run a table scan for that or to continuously monitor the queries to keep mm -hmm. the log of the number of rows. To even get the schema, you might have to like do a read. It's in general, much harder to have the level of visibility that you have into yeah. the warehouse as into a data lake. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the query engine makes like a huge difference there when you have to interact like with uh, with that stuff. Uh, all right, cool. So, Snowflake, uh, Metaplane, like your experience so far, because um, I mean, you mentioned uh, BigQuery, um, Snowflake, and Redshift, and from what I understand, like there's probably like big part of your uh, customer base is on Snowflake. Uh, what's your experience like with these th three? uh platforms so far like give us like your pros and cons of each one of them i think before we go into those from three, sorry just about something from the meta plane uh perspective right like doing observability there's pros and cons of each for mm -hmm. sure snowflake has the richest metadata in terms of the freshness 
and the row counts of different um, tables. Uh, BigQuery also has that metadata. However, to use Metaplane, our customers either have tack us onto an existing warehouse or they provision a warehouse specifically for Metaplane. Mm -hmm. And this is nice because you can separate out the compute and keep track of our internal spend that is incurred through this monitoring. But at the same time, it, you know, we necessarily impose a cost, whereas some users who use Redshift with some, uh, with a, not at their full capacity, can tack on Metaplane at you know, no yeah. visible financial cost to themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's like, okay, it's the trade-off between having like a, the elasticity that like the serverless model that right. BigQuery has compared to, you know, like paying for a cluster that, yeah, obviously it can be underutilized and when it's underutilized, you can put more stuff there without paying more, right? But yeah, it's like uh, the trade of that uh, every infrastructure team has to face at some point <laughs> with hard decisions, right? Uh, exactly. But like from, from um, let's say, uh, in terms of what is supported, like, do you, like, is it like Metaplane, like the same experience across all the three different uh, platforms or like you have like more functionality towards one or the other because of what they expose? We, it's the same experience across all three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no major differences. Okay, that's that's great. And how much of a concern is the cost at the end? I mean, the additional cost that is incurred by a platform like Metaplane that continuously uh, monitors uh, the data on the data warehouse. It's surprisingly much less than people might expect mm -hmm. because we're using information schema as much as possible and the existing metadata. Mm -hmm. So. The, the tests that rely on your metadata, right? We can read that within seconds mm -hmm. uh, at the top of the hour or whatever frequency you set. And it turns out to be a pretty negligible amount of overhead compared to spend that you might have from other processes running on your data warehouse, like, you know, measured in you know, single digit percentage points. Mm -hmm. uh, some customers have longer running queries for much larger tables or more sophisticated monitoring, but typically that step is taken more deliberately so that mm -hmm. the cost is more justified. Mm -hmm. So there are like, uh, let's say there are use cases where like people are, okay, you have, let's say a continuous monitoring where you establish, let's say your, um, uh, how's that? Like the monitors and they run every, I don't know, one hour, 10 minutes, one minute, whatever. Uh, but do you see also like ad hoc um, um, monitoring that users do? Like, do they use the tool also for not just for monitoring, but also to debug problems with the data? Totally. I, that is the next step after the monitoring is if the flag kind of goes off mm -hmm. is now you have this well, one, you know, that an incident occurred, but two, you have this historical record of what the data should be uh, and how it has been over time it's a little bit like debugging once you have a a product analytics tool. yeah yeah where right if you did not have a product analytics tool you don't necessarily know like what the latency has been over time mm -hmm. uh, what the you know, what all the dependencies are what has happened in the user's journey uh, and it's very similar uh, with metaplane where in addition to the core incident management workflow, there's another component, which is trust mm -hmm. and awareness in data, where teams that bring on Metaplane, of course, at first, it's, because, it's often because you know stuff has hit the fan and they're like, okay, now we need to get ahead of it next time around. But right after implementing Metaplane, it could be within a few minutes, and you see how queries are being used across the warehouse, how the lineage looks from within your data stack, it's like, wow, how did, how did I live without this? Is yeah. This yeah. Familiar quote. Okay. 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 Take us by the hand now and like, give us, give us like an example. Like, let's say we have, uh, we have an incident, right? Like a monitor goes off and it's like, oh, something is wrong with this table. Okay. And um, from things that you have experienced, like the common, like example, like, Tell, uh, describe to us like the journey that the user goes through um, 
meta plane uh, from that moment until they can resolve um, the problem. And I'd love to hear like what happens inside meta plane for that and what outside, right? Like mm. how these two like uh, uh, work together for the user like to figure out uh, and solve the problem. So today, Metaplane is like, let's say you have like a home, a, like security system. Mm -hmm. It is the alarm and it is like the video, mm -hmm. but it does not call the, the police for you. And it does okay. not do like the trashing for you. So in Metaplane, we will send you a Slack alert or maybe a pager duty mm -hmm. uh, alert saying the, the, this value we expected it to be 5 million it fluctuates a little bit, but now it's at 1 million. These are the downstream BI reports. So like this dashboard is viewed, has been last viewed today, this many times by these people. And here are the upstream dependencies. So like mm -hmm. there are all the DBT models that go into this model. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can do from there is click into the application and kind of see the, the overall impact of this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. and assess like, okay, what are the immediate upstream root causes? And then two, you can give feedback to our models where if this is actually an anomaly uh, and you want to be continued, continue to be alerted on this, and then you mark it and then we'll kind of exclude it from our models. If it was actually normal, because at the end of the day, data does change and no anomaly detection tool is 100% accurate. Yep. And you click on, you say, okay, this is actually a normal occurrence. Do not continue to alert me on this. Mm -hmm. and frequently, when you have an alert, our customers start a whole conversation around that alert, saying, mm -hmm. uh, right, looping in other members of their team, creating JIRA or like linear tickets to address this issue. Uh, but that is where we stop, mm -hmm. uh, is the actual incident resolution mm -hmm. aspect of it. That's where mm -hmm. we want to go in the future, but today, yeah, it kind of stops yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And what's like a that's my last last question. I will give it to Eric. Uh, give us like some from your experience because obviously you've been exposed like to many different um, uh, users out there and um, uh, issues. So, what's one of the most common reasons that? uh data go bad i like how you, you said that there's many issues because that's what we've observed too it's like the whole you know tolstoy's quote of all all happy families are alike all unhappy families are unhappy in a unique way the same thing <laughs> is true for data right where there's so many reasons why data can go wrong it goes back to what we were saying of you know either someone put it in wrong Mm -hmm. or the machine did something wrong and then or there are some logic mm -hmm. that's applied incorrectly but that said across all of our customers delays are or freshness errors are probably the most common issue mm -hmm. second is probably a schema change whether mm -hmm. it's within the data warehouse or upstream and the third is a volume change where the amount of data that's being loaded or, or exists is higher or lower than you expect mm -hmm. and there's a whole long tail from there uh the and all of that is kind of correlated with the like the causes of data quality issues yeah. so this depends on the team right if it's a one person team you do not have many data engineers or analytics engineers stepping on each other with code right and there might be many more third-party dependencies that cause mm -hmm. issues if you're on a larger team perhaps uh, shipping bugs might be like actual software bugs, not data bugs. Yeah, yeah. Might be more frequent. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Eric, all yours. I monopolized the conversation, but now you can ask all your really, <laughs> yeah, really was, hard questions. It was fascinating. Okay. So I want to let's dig into Tolstoy a bit more because that. That quote is an amazing quote. I think it's called, um, isn't it like a principle, like the Anna Karenina principle or something? Um, That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay. So this is the reason I want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, 
you've mentioned the word trust a lot through our conversation. And in fact, that's been a recurring theme on the show, you know, sort of through a bunch of different iterations. I would even say from the very beginning, Costas, um, just one of the, the themes that comes up consistently. So what's interesting though, is if we think about some of the examples we've talked about, you know, you have the executive stakeholder who's, you know, refreshing a looker report and something's wrong or the salesperson, you know, doesn't necessarily know exactly why, but they know the revenue numbers off or whatever. And so what's interesting is that's, those examples kind of represent a one dimensional trust almost, right? Which is things don't go wrong. Right. Like I trust you if nothing ever goes wrong, <laughs> which, you know, in the real world, like that sort of one dimensional trust, you know, does isn't really a great foundation for relationships. <laughs> so <laughs> like, you know, it's just kind of like the inner current principle, which I know I'm, I'm sort of stretching that a little bit. Um, so thank you for humoring me. But like, it's interesting, right? Like if the reports aren't broken, then everyone's happy. Right. Like. Um, things are good. What are the other dimensions of trust, A, that you've seen, or B, that you are trying to impact with Metaplane or the way that you think about, you know, data quality and lineage and those sorts of things? I love how you brought it back to trust because that is it's simultaneously a very simple problem. I mean, you could state it simply, but also extremely complex, like you're alluding to, where that you could define trust uh, not necessarily that something's going wrong, but that there's some contract between two parties that is violated in some way. Mm. And if the contract is not explicit, then the two parties will always have implicit contracts. And unfortunately, in the data world, the implicit expectation of a data consumer is frequently that the data is just not wrong. It's exactly what you're saying. Is like, yeah. like, if the data is wrong, what am I paying you for? Why are we paying Snowflake so much money if the data is wrong? Yeah. But as we're alluding to, that is not a reasonable expectation across the board. Uh, a reasonable expectation from a data consumer might be, I am aware that data is not perfect, right? That it will never be perfect. Uh, the same way that you will never have software without, uh, without bugs and code. So how can you expect that to be true for data as well? But I think... Part of it is establishing these contracts and these expectations up front uh, with both the data consumers and as well as with data producers uh, and saying, okay, like, this is what you can expect from the data and how it will trend over time and how I'll try my best as a team to make sure that it meets the demands of this particular use case. I think that's a shift that I would love to see in the data world is instead of talking about data being perfect or being ideal, uh, instead talking about it being sufficient for a use case at hand, right? Mm. Where if this dashboard is being used every hour, right? Do we really need real-time streaming data, right? If, you're, if this is making more of a directional decision as opposed to being sent to a customer, right? Does the data have to be completely correct? Right, enough to like shatter your trust in it over time. Right. So I, I think really reverse engineering from the the outcome and the people who are using the data is the most clarifying approach that we found to think about data quality and data trust over time. Super interesting. Okay, let's let's dig into that just a little bit more, just because I'm thinking about our listeners who, you know, and even myself, you know, we deal with these types of things every day. So I I Love what you said, but my guess would be that there are a lot of people out there who, well, let me put it this way. If you have an explicit contract, that requires mutual understanding, right? Um, and, and even mutual agreement on, um, let's say it's a, a real estate contract, right? Like there's mutual agreement on say default and you know other things, right? Um, you know, which both parties need to have a good understanding of for expectations to be set well, right? So if we carry that analogy over to an explicit contract between a data consumer and say like the person who's building the data product, you know, in whatever form that takes, 
the why one of the challenges I think probably a lot of our listeners have faced is that if you try to make that contract explicit, the consumer oftentimes can just say, you know what, like I don't actually really care about <laughs> these definitions that we're trying to agree on, right? And sometimes maybe there's some malcontent there, but a lot of times it's like, look, I'm busy, like we're all busy. And like, I would love to like understand like your pipeline infrastructure and data drift issues and whatever. Can you speak to how you've seen that dynamic play out? I mean, I think in some ways that's getting better as data becomes more valued across the organization, but I think in a lot of places there can still be a struggle to actually make an explicit contract like a practical reality and a collaborative process inside of a company. You're right. It is an idealistic process. Uh, however, I do think the conversation is important uh, not just to talk about expectations of the data, but really just to understand what exactly do the users of data want, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, members of data teams are, it, it's a tough job, right? Because a classic example is, okay, someone asks you for a dashboard, but do they really want a dashboard, right? Do they really <laughs> want this number to be continuously updating over time? And to have a relatively fixed set of questions that can be, you know, varied a little bit, but not be super flexible. Or do they want, you know, uh, data activation to use it again into their you know, <laughs> into Salesforce? Or do they just want a number like right now, and it doesn't have to be changing over time? Or do they want a data application that is you know, maybe more involved but is much mm. more flexible and has both inputs and outputs? Right. I think that is the importance of having a conversation about expectations from user, like your stakeholders is you're right. There are some downsides and it takes a lot of time, but that I think once people like you're that the consumers of your data feel like you really understand where they're coming from, that that is a foundation from which you can build trust. Right. It's like, okay, they kind of get what I'm asking for and reverse. I know the amount of work that goes into producing data products that, okay, now the trust is much less brittle and maybe you don't need that explicit contract, but what you've developed implicitly is, you know, implicit contract that yeah. now I know, okay, it's not when it's completely broken that I can still trust it because there's a human on the other end of it. Yeah. If only there were software that could solve the problem of time com time compression <laughs> and mutual <laughs> understanding and the investment that it takes to build that between two humans. It's, you know, <laughs> we talked before this call about all the you know, SaaS products that exist, but I, I really think you know, tools are just tools, right? They exist because people use them to do processes more effectively and more yeah. consistently over time. Yep. That if you know, a tool doesn't result in something actually changing in terms of people's behavior, you know, and this is you know, a tool that actually is being used by people, not machines, then is it really that important? Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, we are, um, we're close to the buzzer here. I want to end by asking you an, an admittedly unfair question, but that I think will be really helpful for, for our listeners, um, and for me. So, um, and I'll start by the, I'll start with the unfairness. So none of the answers to this question can relate to Metaplane or data lineage or data, you know, quality tooling at all. Okay. <laughs> Got it. So okay. outside of, you know, what you're sort of trying to build, you know, with your life and your team, um, if you could give one piece of advice to our listeners out there who are working in data in terms of building data trust, even maybe like one practical thing they could do this week before the week is over, what's the one thing that you would tell them to do? Like if you could only do one thing to sort of improve trust, what would that one thing be outside of all the, you know, data lineage tooling? <laughs> so sorry oh, for yeah. the unfair question. No, no, I, well, you told, at the end of the day, data lineage, data observability, it's just a technology, right? It is one technology that can be used to solve a much broader problem uh, that can't be solved by one tool or even like 10 tools. I would say to 
conduct some user interviews. Mm. Like if you had a week or two weeks, right, have one-on-ones with every person at the company who could be using your data or is not using the data as much as you would like or in the ways that you would want and sit down and really approach them as if you're like a founder building a product for a customer. What do you really want here? Like what problem are you trying to solve? How will you know that you solve that problem? And how can I improve the product that I'm developing for you? Uh, that I think is a process that like, we've seen our customers, especially the ones who are very, very high performing data teams do over time. And that mm. really starts you from this position of the trust is yours and it's yours to lose as opposed to you start from mm. zero and you have to build it up over time. Super helpful. All righty. Well, uh, thanks for giving us a couple extra minutes uh, for me to ask you an unfair question. Uh, this has been such a great conversation um, and best of luck with Metaplane. It sounds like an awesome tool and it sounds like you're doing great stuff. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, thanks Costas. This has been an amazing conversation uh, and yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm such a fan. Absolutely. Well, Costas, of course, I have to bring up tilapia and you know, the fact that you can drop a tilapia into a tank and they all start to behave the same, um, you know, which is interesting, which actually is pretty similar to VCs with new data technology. It's like you drop a new data technology and all the VCs <laughs> start to behave the exact same way, um, you know, which is really interesting. So that was one takeaway. <laughs> Do you think we should rename FOMO into the tilapia effect or something? <laughs> VC FOMO, the tilapia effect. <laughs> I love it. Um, so that, that was one thing. Um, on a more serious note, I thought the discussion around implicit and explicit contracts was really helpful. You know, I think we talk about the way that data professionals interact with other teams the way that tooling sort of facilitates those interactions, et cetera. And um, thinking, uh, it was helpful for me, even in my own day-to-day -day work, to really just think about what implicit contracts do I have with other people in the organization, right? Whether mm -hmm. they be consumers of data that I produce, you know, maybe for my boss or, you know, for the data that I consume from other data producers. Um, so that was really helpful for me. Yeah, 100%. I think that's like a big uh, part of building organizations. And I, I am pretty sure that you have experienced that uh, by like building companies uh, from scratch and like scaling a company or a team, uh, like big part of it is actually figuring out uh, all these contracts and make them more explicit. Like when we say like we need a process, to make things scale that's what pretty much we are talking about right like when you're alone and you're running the whole growth function on your own like yeah you have like plenty of contracts with yourself right and then you get another person and then another person and suddenly the contract is not exactly the same right and <laughs> that's where <laughs> friction starts and sure. i think one of the first steps that uh, you have to do when like you are trying to scale an organization is actually doing that um, and I think that's just human nature and um, has like it's something that we see with data, it's something that we see with software, it's something that we see with everything. So yeah, 100%, I think that was like an extremely interesting part of the conversation that we had outside of all the rest that we talked about, like the technologies where like observability goes and uh, how they work all together. But that, that, that was actually like my other like very interesting point of like how um, related uh, these products are uh, with some foundational products like the data warehouse for example and what the mm. data warehouse like exposes and the metadata there and how this can be used like to deliver even more value um, in observability and all these things so yeah uh, Always interesting to chat with Kevin and um, hope to have him back really soon. So, agree. All right. Well, thank you for listening. 
And uh, if you like the show, why don't you tell a friend or a colleague about it? We would love uh, for you to share the episodes that you like the most uh, with people you care about. And we will catch you on the next one. Bye.